What's poppin' y'all? Welcome back to the Pee Wee the Plug channel, the place you want to be locked into all postseason long. I know a lot of you know, but for all of y'all that are new, in a postseason, after every single night of postseason games, I always do my review of that night. You know, we break down the series, I give my analysis, things that I'm seeing. So make sure if you enjoy that type of content, you're subscribed here and you're ready for that type of content. Also, while you're here, make sure you hit that like button for me. It always helps. Last night, the playing games, the first set of playing games out west. Very, very interesting and exciting day for myself. I won't lie. This season, like I've said a thousand times, is going by so fast. And I think it's because it was such a fun season. They say when you're having fun, time flies and the NBA season um, is an example of that. So with all of the parity, all of the teams being so close in each conference, I felt like the playoffs is like we are setting ourselves up to have one of the most interesting and exciting and competitive playoffs seasons that we've had in a very long time. And tonight and last night, I should say rather, uh, was an example of that. The Pelicans and the Lakers will start off with the first game, came out and was exciting. It was everything that I could hope for because there was a part of me that was a little worried because I'm like, okay, there's a couple games where the Lakers really guarded Zion well. And if you neutralize Zion, you really affect the rest of the Pelicans team. He is the engine. He is the battery. And when he's able to get himself going, the attention that he commands opens up everything else for the Pelicans offense, which is why I don't think there's a coincidence that the Pelicans shoot the three balls so well. You have a guy like him who is damn near virtually unstoppable at getting to the rim and finishing at the rim that you have to send bodies. I don't care who you have on your roster, what defenders you have. When Zion is going downhill, you have to send help. And once you do, he has turned himself into a fantastic passer, especially out of the air. And he can hit guys, and they have shooters. They have marksmen. Trey Murphy III can make shots. CJ can make shots. Ingram can make shots. Alvarado can make shots. Herb has stepped up and improved as a jump, shoot, jump shooter. Uh, Jordan Hawkins, the rookie out of UConn, though we probably won't see him in, a lot, um, obviously, in the, the play-in or the playoffs if they make it. He's a guy who, in some parts of the season, he's gotten hot. Um, game started off well. Zion got go going early. I really feel like... The unsung hero for me in this first half of this game specifically is D'Angelo Russell. Um, D'Angelo Russell really came out and I think matched LeBron James. I got notes in front of me, so when you see me look down at my phone, um, that's what I'm peeping at. But yeah, D'Lo, 15 first half points, matched LeBron there. He made almost every single neatly shot, timely shot for the Lakers in that first half because the Pelicans came out strong and they came out aggressive um, and they came out with an eight point lead. And I was like, OK, that's the prototypical first quarter you want to have if you're the Pelicans. You want to send a message like early to the Lakers that this isn't that same one of those games from recent or the play in uh, or the season tournament game. This is a different team. We got a pep in our step. We hungry. We feel like we could win. We know we can win, and we're going to show y'all that we're going to win by winning the first quarter and getting this crowd behind us early and trying to use that home court advantage to our advantage. And that was a big statement quarter uh, for me, that first quarter. But the quarter to me that really swayed this game in hindsight and in real time was that second quarter. Watching this game and watching that first quarter, I was like, okay, we have something. But literally, a few minutes later, we get into that second quarter, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, this may be over. I remember watching in the Discord and talking to my friends and saying, hey, this, yeah, this one might be wraps. Like, the Lakers, the Lakers might have taken, this, taken them out of the game already after such an uh, electric first quarter. That second quarter, only three, three players for the Pelicans scored. One was Zion, of course. The other was Brandon Ingram. And the last one was C.J. McCollum, who went one of six. He barely he, he barely made the cut. But they had three Pelican players score. They got outscored in that second quarter, 34 to 16. They lost that second quarter by 18 points. So the eight-point advantage that they had after one evaporates into a 10-point deficit going into the half. And now that crowd has kind of gone out. It's not as electric. You got everybody kind of looking around. The bench for the Pelicans was absolutely just non-existent. They had five points on two of eight shooting. And on the flip side, I think that's where the Lakers really got their advantage. I, that second quarter production from the bench that the Lakers got was like, I, I really think that that tipped over the scale. This wasn't by any means a necessarily bad game from 
Anthony Davis, considering the plays he made in the fourth and the fourth quarter that he had. But this also wasn't a game where, like, LeBron and AD came in and was like, you know what? We're the two best players on the floor. We're the two best players on our team. We're just going to win this game, and there's nothing you're going to be able to do about it. This is one of the games where, like, the Lakers as a team won this game. Like I mentioned, D'Angelo Russell had an incredible first half with 15 points, no turnovers, timely bucket after timely bucket, big threes. Even when they were losing, those threes that D'Lo was making was allowing the game to stay close because it felt like the Pelicans were picking up momentum after that first quarter to be able to really stray away and really build on that. But they only lost that quarter by eight. It wasn't like a double-digit thing or anything that got out of control. And I think part of that was because of some of the shots that D'Lo hit and some of the shots that he hit in that second quarter, which kind of added on to to, to the, the punch that the Lakers were giving the Pelicans from a defensive standpoint, but also that bench. The Lakers bench scored 14 points on 5 of 12 shooting. And to me, it was really 5 of 9 shooting. Uh, especially then when he played 5 minutes in the second quarter, he went 0 of 3. You remove him out of it, and you get 14 points on 5 of 9 shooting. That's Torian Prince with 6 points, Gabe Vincent with uh, 6 points, and then that's also Jackson Hayes. So, like I said, Gabe Vincent in the 2-3s he hit, he also had the side of the backboard shot. That was uh, That's always funny to see. But when he hit his 2-3s and you saw Torian Prince hit 3s, it's like, oh, shit. The Lakers are getting some help. You know, the Lakers are getting some help because it kind of was like, okay, AD is kind of, you know, prancing around, not having this crazy first half. But then it's like, damn, D'Lo is kind of making up some of the absence for him. And then it's like, okay, maybe Zion is still able to shield this off. But then it's like, nah, their bench is coming alive. And to me, that's that's the real that's the real part of the game that I remember as a viewer in real time. And then looking back in hindsight, that was really it. You also look at the third the third quarter. The third quarter in this game, in my notes, is where I say I feel like this is the, the quarter that the Pelicans really had a chance to really take this game back. They did win the quarter. They won it by three points, but I really felt like this could have been a much bigger quarter for them. And the reason being is because the Lakers had zero bench points this quarter. After such a phenomenal second quarter or, or first half from the bench, you get zero points from them in the third. D'Lo also goes scoreless in the third. And LeBron goes one of three with four points. And Anthony Davis goes one of three for four points. So combined, they go of two of six with only eight points. And four of those eight points came from the free throw line because Anthony Davis and LeBron both made two free throws. So when you see that and you hear that, that was their quarter. But then you see Rui Hachimura had about six, seven or eight points that quarter. I think Austin Reeves had like seven points in that third quarter. And the Pelicans, they won it but they weren't really able to take full advantage. If they are able to have a bigger quarter and take more advantage of D'Lo going score, scoreless, LeBron and AD combining to go two of six from the field and getting zero bench points, I think the game is swayed. They lose that game by four points. You're able to win that quarter by more than three and win that quarter by, like I'll say, eight or nine. Because if you were able to have that first quarter that you had, you should have been able to really double down in this third quarter. And that's just the point where CJ wasn't really giving you much. Um, Brandon Ingram was just having like one of those tough games. And I'll, I'll talk about Brandon Ingram for a second because there was a lot of conversation on like, why wasn't he playing? Whatever. This is why for me as a basketball analyst, I'm always very, very cautious to the player returning from injury in the middle of the fire. I was very, very critical of the Joel Embiid injury and how it was going to be handled if he was not going to be able to play before the playoffs started. Once I found out and once they announced that they were going to be able to play Embiid a handful of games before the season started and the play-in started and everything, before the playoffs started, I was extremely for that. I was extremely bought into that thought process of, hey, let him play three or four games, get his feet under him, get his wind under him, Knock some rust off, get get reprogrammed on how teams play you, what they expect, the pace of the game, the physicality, 
all of those things are important when you're coming off of entry. There, there is no replication of real basketball. You can't simulate it. You can't go and practice and play three on three. You can't go and practice and play five on five and get that real game experience of the crowd being there, drilling and rush, you know, breaking a sweat in the in the early game pre pre game warm ups. You know what I'm saying? Like real game plan. Curveball is being thrown at you in the third. They're playing you different than how they played you in the first quarter. Now the double team is coming from a blind spot. You know, all of these things are just you got to get reprogrammed to, to, to being able to, to handle all of that in real time in the midst of a real NBA game. Real NBA game with real adrenaline. It's hard to simulate that. It, it is so, so hard to simulate that. So when you talk about a player coming from injury and missing a few weeks, missing a month, missing a month and a half to two months or even three months, and then just coming back in this type of environment, this type of environment, it's, it's very hard. And Brandon Ingram, I feel like, was going through that. And Willie Green picked that up. And Willie Green in his post game said he just felt more comfortable with the lineup that he had. Knowing Brandon Ingram came off of injury, um, you know, not wanting him to force anything and do anything like that. And I, I can't necessarily be mad at it. But there's also this thing where, like, I remember Willie Green saying before the game, um, Ingram should have an increase in his minutes. You know what I mean? In Ingram, should you should see more from him. And I think it's so easy to say that when there hasn't been that much time coming off of the injury. You know what I'm saying? And I just feel like they threw him in the fire. And this is this is why I'm always a guy that's like, nah, let him have three or four games. You know what I'm saying? Let him have a, a week of basketball instead of just like, oh, he, he's technically back. He played a little bit here. He did a little bit there. Um, and that that's just one of the things that I took from it. So hopefully Brandon Ingram can have this game and be able to use it as a bounce back um, tomorrow because we know if they lose tomorrow, then they're completely out of it. But th th that's just my two cents. I don't think Willie Green was wrong. I don't think it was the wrong decision. I think in hindsight, it's always easy to be like, man, you should have did this. You should have did that. Trey Murphy the third ended up having a really, really big um, second half for them. He had a really big fourth quarter and was a part of the reason that they had that chance to even win the game um, down the stretch. But I really look back at that third quarter and I'm like, that was y'all, that was y'all chance to really take back that second quarter that the Lakers gained on you. You know what I mean? The Lakers won that second quarter by 18 points. 18 points. And for you to win that third quarter after everything that I just said by only three points, little disappointing there. Little disappointing. And then in the fourth quarter, LeBron won one of eight from the field. Again, something else that you feel like you can really, you can really, you know, take advantage of. But D'Angelo Russell had two extremely big three-point shots. Two, two, like I'm talking about huge shot. This dude all game long made big shots. If you didn't watch this game and you looked at the box score, it's like, oh damn, D'Lo had D'Lo player. He had a good game. When you've watched the game in real time, he had a great game. It's very important to know when shots were made. You know what I mean? Like it's extremely important to know. When, where, and how shots were made versus looking and being like, oh, okay. Just like Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis in a box score, you may be like, damn, he could have did better. This could have been a better game for, for Anthony Davis. But I look at that, that fourth quarter where he had 10 points and he had four rebounds. But the thing about those rebounds, all four of those fourth quarter rebounds Anthony Davis had were offensive. Offensive rebounds. And there is one rebound that I think ultimately won them the game and saved the day where LeBron was dribbling out trying to have that last, last possession. He went left, and he did like a turnaround fadeaway over two people, and he missed. The Pelicans at this point, it's either they're down two, I believe, down two. They have a chance to get this rebound, go tie it, or maybe take the lead. I can't remember, um, but it was very close, and this is a crucial part of the game. And Anthony Davis got the offensive rebound. He ultimately got fouled, and I think he hit two free throws to put him up four. So, yeah. This was a one possession game. The Pelicans are trying to get this stop to get the ball, go tie that game down. And um, Anthony Davis was able to go out there and get that offensive rebound. Pelicans bench gave him everything in that fourth quarter, gave him 17 points. Um, just ultimately not enough. Disappointing, obviously. The, the elephant in the room is Zion Williamson leaving with the leg soreness or whatever. That was so abrupt. That was such a surprise. That was at the point where they were making that run, and you felt like, man, the Pelicans can win this game. The most exciting part of this game in that fourth quarter to see um, Zion 
throwing down a towel in frustration and having to go to the locker room. Everybody in America who's watching this game as a basketball fan is just absolutely confused. We don't know what's going on. And you look back at that part of the game and you could really, you really could look at that and say that changed the entire momentum of the game. He had 40 points for them. And to take away your guy who who was basically dominating and to, to look around at the rest of the team, like go figure it out. It's just tough. It's unfortunate. Um, and and it, it, it's sad for Z because this is like his first real playoff type basketball. And he answered the call against a team who has played him well defensively. They have played him well. You know what I'm saying? And for him to go out and have the game that he did, you would have loved to seen him be a part of that last stretch to potentially give his Pelicans that chance to win the game because it's hard to it's hard to view the game and say where it would go. The Lakers could still very well have closed that game out even with Zion there, but you definitely like the chances for the Pelicans a lot more with Zion being out there. Great thing for them. They have one more game. Have not heard an update on Zion besides the fact that it's sore. They're going to take the MRI, look at it or whatever. Um, but they do have another chance against the Sacramento Kings, who we're about to talk about uh, right here in a second. Um, I do know one thing against the Kings. A lot of guys are going to have to play better. Jonas Valanciunas, 1-7 of seven from the field. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. I know Anthony Davis is a fantastic defender, but that's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. 1-7 of seven is unacceptable. As a big man, a 7-foot or a bruiser, 6-11, whatever you want to call him. Like, one of seven, just absolutely terrible. C.J. McCollum, shots are going to be made, shots are going to be missed. He took some shots that I was just like, why? That was a shot that I I can't remember if it was the first or second half. It's maybe a third quarter where they got to stop, and he was trailing, and Alvarado kind of flipped it back to him. And he took the, this this crazy leaning from the, the wing type three-point shot and missed And it was just like, why get that shot? Why get that shot? Also, Alvarado and the technical foul wasn't a fan of that. You have to learn how to play passionate without making those silly mistakes. Because you look back at the game when you lose by four, and it's like all of those little things matter. The momentum matter. Cherishing every single possession. Every shot matters. Every play, every foul, everything matters. It's a lot different than a regular season. But every single possession is to be valued and everything has to be in a place where we don't want to give this team any advantage, whether it's added points, whether it's turnovers and extra possessions, whether it's loose balls and offensive rebounds, and whether it's things that can shift the momentum. Getting a technical technical foul when y'all rolling like that and they got to get reviewed and they got to it's only allowing the Lakers to go over there and talk game plan. It's getting your crowd settled. These are all little added factor things that don't necessarily show up in the box score. But from a viewer who analyzes the game, it all matters when you're rolling and you're trying to use that home court to your advantage, as we say. So those are the things that I think they're going to have to tighten up against the Kings um, tomorrow. And I think they still have a chance. Obviously, we have to understand the final verdict on on Zion Williamson and what's going to happen there. But uh, we could have another really good one because the Kings are going to be extremely hungry. Speaking on the Kings. My takeaways and some of my notes. Jonathan Kaminga in the first half took more shots than Steph Curry and Klay Thompson combined. He had 11 field goal attempts. They had 10 combined, five apiece. 10. This is essentially a game seven closeout that they just kind of went through last year against the Kings. Same environment. Pretty much the same team, same coaching staff for the most part. And I I I just don't I, I don't get I, I don't I don't know. There's like a, a sense of urgency that just wasn't there for whatever reason. It, and it came a little too late. I was not a fan, and I know Clay Thompson eventually goes scoreless in this game, all of ten from three uh from the field, all of six from three. I, I get it. But just the mere fact that a guy like Jonathan Kaminga can come off the bench. And I think he played fewer first half minutes than them both. And he still shot more field goal attempts than both of you. And he tried to carry them in that second quarter. He put his backpack on. He really did. He really, really, really did. And if it wasn't for him, this game, they have no chance, in my opinion, if it wasn't for Jonathan Kaminga. Because that run he went on in the second half where he was backpacking them, that came in a very crucial part of the game where I was thinking that the Kings could 
could run away with this in the first half and, and shut this door completely closed. But because of that stretch he went on when he was hitting those mid-range jumpers and doing what he was doing, it gave the it gave the Warriors a slight chance to keep keep at it, keep that door slightly open and not all the way shut. And I just wanted to I wanted to see a little bit more aggression from Steph Curry than a two or five first half, personally. Knowing everything that's on the line here, not only from the season standpoint, but from the dynasty, this that's potentially the last time Klay Thompson could put on a Warriors uniform. Unless a performance like this works in the Warriors' favor where they come back to the, the table and they say, hey, not only can we not give you a max, we have to give you below than what, what we thought we were. Klay Thompson may have to go to the Warriors and stay and, and want to stay there because he just loves the Warriors and he just loves playing with Steph Curry and Draymond Green. Like that that's how bad this was. This season was already already a roller coaster for Clay, and it was a tough one for him. But to end like this, O of 10, O of 6, zero fucking points. Not a free throw made. Zero. You had more fouls than points. This that really could have been his last game. And not only his last game, it's hard to picture any other team out there on the market really giving them boohoo money. So I, I'm not one of those people. I, I do acknowledge that it could be the last game, but I'm not a person who's completely on the the, the thought process of Clay Thompson's gone because who else is giving him money? The only reason that there would ever be needed for him to leave is from a financial standpoint. If the Warriors are saying, hey, you know, we're trying to restructure this team. We, we're going to need you to take a, a significant, you know, uh, pay cut, or maybe we don't give you the amount of years you want. And there's another team out there that's like, hey, Clay, we'll give you almost 10 more extra million dollars, almost, uh, you know, seven to 10 more extra million dollars, and we'll add on two more years to your contract. That would be the reason that you would leave. But I'm not sure that's going to be out there. I, I'm just not sure. I'm, I'm not completely sure that that's going to be out there. I think whatever contract he gets from the Warriors, the market may say the same exact thing. They literally may say the same exact thing because looking from this season and looking at this closeout game, there's just not much that you can buy into to do too much to pry him away from Golden State. It just wouldn't make that. I, I personally, as a GM, wouldn't be comfortable with giving him anything significantly higher or better than what the Warriors are giving him because based off this season, I don't know what my production is going to be. And it's going to be a new situation, a new scenario, a new locker room, a new coaching staff, a, a new set of teammates, a new scheme. You throw in all of that unfamiliarity. And based on what he got in a familiar situation, I, I just don't know if that's going to be a good enough bargain for a team to go to go out there and do. Um, on the King side, Fox, Sabonis, and Keegan Murray played like a big three in the first half. I mean, Keegan Murray was lights out. Sabonis came out and did his thing. Uh, Fox was was dynamic as always. I love when he gets to that mid range. It beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Keegan Murray made every three. Um, guard is Steph Curry, like I predicted on on the numbers on the board podcast, and I think really did a really good job. Um, and 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 they 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 came out like a team that wasn't scared. And on my panel for the numbers on the board, we all picked the Warriors because we felt like the Malik Monk and Kevin Herter, um, you know, the the them being out was going to play such a such a big part to this. And you have the best player on your side in Steph Curry, and we saw what he was able to do in the seven game series and. You thought maybe he could come in and, and replicate, not necessarily having 50, but at least having more of an imprint on the game. But six turnovers for Steph, three free throws attempted, 16 shots. I mean, it's just, again, disappointing, man. Disappointing. Because you, you just feel like your best player comes out a little bit more swinging. 16 shots, y'all. He took one more shot than Jonathan Kaminga. One more shot. Really? And then we'll get to some of these other guys. Um, like I said, for the Pelicans, though, the quarter that's, that stood out the most for me, that was really like, that's it. And it's ironic that it happened against the Warriors because this was their signature during their dynasty run, was the third quarter. The Kings gave the Warriors an old-fashioned th third quarter run that the the Warriors made a, made a dynasty out of doing. In that third quarter, Keegan Murray and De'Aaron Fox almost outscored the Warriors them damn selves. They had 24 combined points. The Warriors themselves as a team had 26. They dominated that third quarter. 
That is the third quarter of a coach's dream against a team like the Warriors. In a play-in game situation, that third quarter is what every coach and GM would dream to have. You dream to have that. At at home, crowd behind you, the sec- the first half went well. You won the second half, but that second quarter, the Warriors fought a little bit more harder. And you come out and you answer with that in the third quarter, phenomenal. Um the Warriors, they doubled the King turnovers. They had 16 turnovers as a team, the Warriors, and the Kings only had eight. The Kings nearly doubled the offensive rebounding. They had 15 offensive rebounds compared to the Warriors' eight. The Kings shot as a team 46% from three. The Warriors shot 31% from three. Wiggins, four of 11 with 12 points, one of four from three, three of five from the free throw line, three turnovers, two assists. Klay Thompson, 0 of 10, scoreless, 0 of six from three. I mean... Ah, <sighs> Moses Moody and, and Jonathan Kaminga try to give you something. I This team cannot look this way when it comes back next season. You talk about pennies on a dollar. I, I mean, you might have to give Andrew Wiggins up for free. If, if a team will take him. I think pennies on a dollar is too rich for Andrew Wiggins. Seriously, I'm not even trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I, I just don't understand what's going like bad. He had the he had the worst plus minus in the, in the entire game. He had a negative twenty five. He did worse than a guy who scored zero points. Understand that. His plus minus is worse than a guy who played thirty one minutes and didn't make a fucking shot. Bad, terrible, terrible. And a, a, a lot of the other things that I don't like about the Warriors is like for a long time, I've been super critical on Draymond Green. You know what I mean? Controlling his emotions, understanding everything plays a single part. Kind of like the same thing I said about Alvarado when he got that tech um, early on in that, that Pelicans Lakers game. You know, Draymond Green, obviously, he, that has been a detriment to this team and their, their, their dynasty and legacy. Right. We could talk about the Cavs and the suspension. We could talk about the Jordan Poole punch. We could talk about this year with the Rudy Gobert shit and then get suspended. Maybe if he's not, not maybe, but if he hasn't suspended and missed the games, he has to miss and be out indefinitely. The Warriors probably not even in this position, just being honest, because they are so much better when he's on, when he's with them on the floor. This team is completely different. Cannot take that away from Draymond Green, no matter what criticism you have for him. But one thing that I can side with him on, and I can understand a little bit of his passion and emotion, everybody else on this fucking team has no type of like, I don't even know the word. They're so nonchalant. Andrew Wiggins is the poster child for nonchalantness, and it drives me fucking crazy. It drives me absolutely insane to watch this team sometimes just sit there and fucking walk up and down the court, lightly jog, no sense of urgency. This isn't the fucking play-in where our season can be over. It drives me fucking crazy. To watch this team play sometimes. Careless with the fucking basketball. You got Steve Kerr overthinking every fucking thing. It takes this type of performance for Moses Moody to get some fucking minutes. Because Jonathan Kaminga had to damn near ask out to get minutes. Ask out to get minutes. Steph Curry, five shots in the first half. An MVP, a champion. And you play like that against the Kings, who are down two people out of their rotation. They had Keon Ellis, who I had as a sleeper. But but please understand, Keon Ellis should not have had the impact he had against y'all who have a fucking dynasty. Y'all are champions. This shit was pathetic. I'm not a Warriors fan. I'm just a fan of good basketball. And I love what they've done to the game, had the impact. But if I'm Mike Dunleavy, if I'm part of the ownership... A lot of this shit has to change. I don't give a fuck about this three staying together. That shit is signed, sealed, delivered. It's done. It's over. It happened. We had all of those years to celebrate it and champion it. That I'm not hanging on to this shit for, for, for a good feeling. I'm not. Steph Curry. Hello. You say you want to win? You want to be somewhere where you can do that? You can't hang on to this. You cannot. That, that shit was in man i don't I, I can't say enough how bad this was and it 
I can't. I, I really can't speak enough how bad this was, man. This was this was bad. This was bad for your season to be on the line. And we got some of the performances that we had. Hey, man, Draymond Green came out. He hit that three point shot to start the game. I was like, oh shit, oh shit. You know, Draymond Green hits. He hit a three. Let alone a three. He hit two in his game. Draymond Green hit two threes. It's like, oh shit, good night. If I tell anybody, hey, man, Draymond Green is going to have two three point two three point shots made, and he's been shooting a three ball real real good this season for sure. But still, anytime you get that, you know what type of time it is when Draymond makes that first one. That's a good night. That That's always a sign of all shit what we getting ourselves into. But this is bad, man. This is bad. It was no sense of urgency. No sense of urgency. No sense. Six turnovers from Steph. Three turnovers from Wiggins. Why the fuck does he even have the ball to do that? Why? Why, did, why, the, why the fuck is Andrew Wiggins playing 25 fucking minutes when he's playing like this? Why? 25 minutes. I would have just played Moody. Kavon Looney, eight minutes. Why? Why even play him? Trace Jackson Davis, 10 minutes. Cool. But but why am I playing? I, I don't know, man. I, I have no idea. I, 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 don't, I don't know. The team leader in rebounds. AirPods. The rookie. The guard. He was willing to get down there and go in the trenches. At least Looney had five rebounds in, in eight minutes. You think w- Wiggins went out and rebounded? No. That takes effort. He ain't showed us that since they won the championship. Remember when he was playing with effort? Remember when he was playing with heart? Remember he wasn't so nonchalant? He had a sense of urgency. He was attacking off his rebound. And it made all of the difference in the world for the Warriors. And it made us as a basketball community look at Andrew Wiggins as one of the most high-valued role players in the league. Remember that that guy? Three rebounds, two defensive, one offensive. No heart. This team is weak. This team is weak. And because of that, I now look at Draymond Green a little differently. Now I'm not saying he should be punching the teammate. I'm not saying he should be putting Rudy Gobert in the fucking headlock and doing all that that crazy shit. But when I see him being overly passionate, when I see him talking shit to opponents and doing all of the antics and doing some of those things, obviously everything needs a healthy medium and a healthy balance. I can't fault him anymore because this is the shit he sees in the locker room at practice, constant day to day to day to day to day. And because of all of the other shit he's done, he can't really go out there and explode because he has this reputation now, which is why I wish... He didn't do all of those things because then he would be able to hold guys more accountable. It's hard to hold guys accountable when you're suspended. You punch a teammate. You're going through all of this. You're going through all It's hard. It's very hard to hold people accountable. But I know if Draymond didn't have all of that on his reputation and on his resume, he would definitely have lit a fire under a lot more of these guys because just watching this game and watching how these guys was moping up and down the floor. I turn the ball over and I just go up and down. Come on, man. Fuck out of here. Um, I'm done talking about the Warriors. Have a good offseason. Mike Dunleavy, I, I pray that you do something for you. I hope y'all not sitting around trying to figure out creative ways to keep Steph, Clay, and Dre together. I hope that, and if it is, then don't I want to hear shit about winning. That's a fairy tale. That's not winning. Look around at the league. Those three guys are not competing with a lot of this shit. Those three guys got outplayed by Keegan Murray, Fox, and Sabonis, who are good. But they're not great, which is why they're in a the play-in and they have to win a second game just to make the playoffs. Right? So that's not even talk about the upper echelon in the NBA. Um, yeah, y'all are also the team that almost lost your damn spot to the, the, the Jalen Green-led Rockets. Uh, anyway, that's my reaction to the last night's games. I will have another one of these videos, maybe probably tomorrow as well for the Eastern Conference games. We got the Miami Heat against the Philadelphia 76ers, and then we have the Chicago Bulls against the Atlanta Hawks. Um, I'm really excited about the Heat game, 76ers game. Obviously, as a Nick fan, this game is very, very big. I can't talk about it enough. Whoever wins this game plays against us. Um, as a Nick fan, we're rooting for Miami. Go, Heat, go. Let's go. Uh, but at the same time, I just want to see some really good basketball. I am predicting that the Philadelphia 76ers will pull this off, but it's hard to doubt Eric Spolstra and his defensive uh, schemes and mindset and how he can neutralize or not necessarily neutralize, but um, find a way to limit Joel Embiid from single-handedly beating you. But you know I have Tyrese Maxey to worry about as well. 
But he healed off that bench is always going to be a dangerous threat to have with his three-point shooting. So it's going to be interesting to see the route that the Heat take with that. And then the Chicago Bulls in Atlanta, um, two teams who have been disappointing, but they are close to each other as far as the two type, the seasons that they've had. So that could be a really interesting game, um, kind of reminiscent from last year. I would think they, I think they played against each other last year as well. That could be a, that could be a good one just from a evenness perspective. Whoever wins that game, I think loses to whoever loses the game between Miami and Philadelphia. So hypothetically speaking, the Philadelphia 76ers beat the, the Miami Heat. They play against the Knicks. And then the winner of Atlanta and Chicago plays against the Heat. I'm probably taking the Heat there too. Uh, we'll see though. So yeah, like I said in the intro, make sure this is a place that you're subscribed to. If you're not already, hit that like button for me. Leave all reactions, opinions, and predictions for tonight in the comments. And I will see you guys tomorrow. We locked in all playoffs long. I am PB the Plug. This is PB the Plug channel. I'll see y'all next time. I'm out. Peace.